I, let me start. So I am a software guy. I'm a technologist, and I love that stuff. I am also a teacher guy, uh, an educator. And before I got into teaching and education, I was given a bit of a warning. I saw it coming, though. And the warning is um, that teaching is hard, right? It's true. I can say that. Um, as teachers, we deserve a lot of credit. Uh, if we were paid a little bit more, perhaps we wouldn't need all that credit, but, you know, here we are. <laughs> the other thing I kind of learned along the way is, as I, as I forayed into teaching officially, is that curriculum building is harder. It's really hard. And beyond that, improving the curriculum and keeping on top of things is probably the hardest. That's my opinion. Now, um, I've basically been uh, building software for a long time. I, I can actually tell you, you know, how the internet works. I can build an app probably right here. Um, uh, and I, can, I can't explain Snapchat just yet, but uh, <laughs> apparently, apparently that's a big part of the internet. I, I got some reading to do there. Um, but, you know, as I've been teaching people how to do this and, and working with technology and education, I naturally, being in both worlds, um, started to draw parallels between them. Um, I started to see that there's a lot of commonality between the technology space and the education space. If you think about it, technology and education both serve other industries, don't they? They're all about pushing other industries forward, giving them the right tools and the right people um, to move forward. And it really, from a, from a student or user perspective, it's really all about the experience and the outcome, isn't it? So I think teaching is also hard because it's not just a straight science. It's, uh, you can't just, there's no one right answer with teaching, is there? And it's not, it's not just an art either, it's both. And I think software is the same. Both of these things are a craft, and that's another commonality between them. They, they take effort from both sides, and I think the right the, to get it right, it's really about finding the balance between the science and the art, and to really perfect that craft. And I think ultimately, like with any craft, it really comes down to the approach. And I think it's, it's, it's with the approach, when you start thinking about that, that these two different industries, technology and education, to me, are not on the same path. You know, on one hand, technology is propelling these under, other industries forward at a rapid pace, you know, and really disrupting them, disrupting itself even, right? And I don't just mean in terms of releasing new versions of iPhones and new, new technology, but even just the methodologies that are used behind the scenes that we as consumers don't see are, are actually being questioned constantly in the, in the technology space. And I think that's where education isn't there. Um, it, it, uh, it doesn't have that, um, that constant change that I see in the technology field. And that's really um, what leads to this, this gap, this ever-increasing gap between, um, between the academic world and the, the industry, the real world. And, you know, that's, that's really something, actually, um, there's a talk by a gentleman named uh, Ken Robinson, a TED Talk, a Sir Kevin Robinson, I should say, uh, he gives a, he gives a, he's actually given a few TED Talks, and one of them, one of my favorites is, uh, Do Schools Kill Creativity? I don't know if you guys have, guys have seen it. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, you should. It's, it's amazing. I've seen it like 1,000 times. 1,000, is that even a number? No. 1,000. Um, <laughs> I'm in edumacation. <laughs> uh, and in this talk, um, Ken talks about a bunch of different things, but he says that, you know, our education system isn't teaching people for the future. Uh, it's not even teaching people for 15 years in, in the future or even five years in the future because it's hard to see what the future is. Um, well, my contention, Ken, is that our education system isn't even teaching people for today. And that, that's, uh, that's challenging. So what have we done so far? We have, to fix this, we threw, we said, well, there's this big gap, let's throw technology into the mix. So we've added technology into the classroom, haven't we? And you know what? I'm a technologist, so you know, it's hard for me to say this. Technology definitely has a place, but sometimes you see technology being overused in everywhere, right? 
It's quite distracting at times. And uh, I do see it generally sometimes overused in even the classroom. It's almost like technology diarrhea. I don't even know. Yeah, I just made that up. Um, <laughs> technology diarrhea, TM. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm a technologist, so it's hard for me to say this. But, um, but I think that we have to be caref careful because it's this balance, right? We always have to strike that balance. And uh, there's actually a gentleman, another gentleman I want to mention. Um, he lives in the valley. His name is Alan Eagle. And Alan Eagle is uh, a little less known than, than Mr. Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson, uh, but he writes for Google. He writes uh, the speeches for Eric Schmidt. So this guy is uh, pretty important. Um, and he is not the only one, but he sends his children to a technology-free elementary school. His daughter uh, went to a technology-free elementary school called Waldorf. And uh, in fifth grade, she still didn't know how to use Google. That's pretty incredible. Uh, and you know what? It's OK. She'll, she'll learn that stuff. Uh, in no time will she learn how to consume the internet. Right? She's probably, that was a year ago, so she's probably like already on Snapchat right now with her friends. Right? <laughs> but you know, er earlier I was saying how, how teaching is, is hard and uh, how you have to strike this balance. And I think that while the technology industry has found this, the reason it's doing well is it's found this balance between art and, uh, and science, I think that the education industry still has to do that a little bit better. And we have. We've tried to use science, haven't we? We, uh, we tried this approach uh, that we coined um, data-driven education, um, where we looked at uh, a whole bunch of different things and uh, had, you know, when I say data different education to people, what comes up uh, as they laugh is, uh, you know, almost like their blood, the blood rushes off their face, right? And they go, whoa, 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 hold up. Um, because they think, about, um, they think about the standardized tests. They think about testing as the way of accumulating data. They think about technology outside and inside of the classroom basically disrupting the uh, education process, taking control away from the teachers and that creativity. If it is a craft, you need that creative thinking, and you need the teachers to be that vehicle behind it. So uh, my contention and my point is that it should be about bringing that information and that, uh, that data into the classroom. And to be honest, there is no point in collecting data if you're not going to actually act on it, because data is just a fancy word for information. So it does make sense from a scientific perspective that we act on information, doesn't it? that we drive our decisions about curriculum changes on, on information instead of on guesswork. And of course, there's that balance. So there's that human element that still needs to be there. We can't just rely on data. Ultimately, data drives the decisions, but humans make the decisions, and those humans should be the teachers. So another big part of data-driven education to me is if you're going to be collecting that data, you should be acting on it, not just at a macro level to compare and contrast different school systems, but actually to look at your education system, education yesterday, and compare it to today and see how it's doing. And this is constant rapid iteration, as I call it. And this concept of rapid iteration is actually very prominent in the technology space. There's something called the Lean Startup Methodology, if you haven't heard of it. And the Lean Startup Methodology says that users don't know what they want, so don't ask them. It also says that you don't know what will work, so don't make any guesses. And what the Lean methodology tries to do, uh, what, it, what its goal is, is to reduce waste, reduce waste uh, when you're producing things, as well as bridge that gap between what ought to be and what is. And, and this applies really well to education, doesn't it? It works really well in the technology space, but it applies really well to education because students don't know what they don't know, so you can't ask them. And there's this gap, and we don't know what the future holds, so how are we going to actually build our education system for it? Well, this is where rapid iteration comes in. So what Lean Methodology says is, build something quickly and put it out there in front of your users and then measure. And that's where the data-driven education aspect comes in. So this is what I applied to my school. I actually uh, went ahead and built my own school um, a few years ago. And we started with six students. I was the only teacher. And I, you know, this is something I haven't actually told any educator in person. I'm almost embarrassed about it. Or just I, maybe there's going to be tomatoes that come flying at me at some point. But I actually had 
three weeks of curriculum built. I had an outline, but I had three weeks of curriculum built when I started my program. Fast forward to today, a few years later, and we collect about uh, upwards of 280 data points per, per student. Uh, it's an eight-week-long program. And guess how many of those data points are tests? Three. So tests aren't everything. In fact, from the other data points that we collect, we generally know how people are going to do on tests. And tests are just really to you know, almost uh, motivate students a little bit more. And it's not just that data either. We collect data on the teachers as well as on every single activity that a student does throughout the day and at the end of the day. And the way we do it is every interaction that happens between the teacher and the student is an opportunity to measure. It's an opportunity to teach, but you can also deduce how the student is doing. Are they ahead? Are they behind? And we actually quickly journal. And you don't need technology to do it. That's how we ended up doing it. But to be honest, you could start very low fidelity and, and do it in an Excel spreadsheet or just on paper. So um, that really helps us. What, what do we do that for? It really helps us because we can look back at the data from previous day and, and, and really personalize our education for the students. Oh, this, person was, this student was really struggling with this topic. Let me sit down with them for 20 minutes as a different teacher who's read these notes and actually work on it. So it's really about information, right? It's about collaboration between the teachers as well. There's, I'm going to end off with something called the Marshmallow Challenge. I really enjoy the Marshmallow Challenge. Have you guys heard of it? Yeah? Um, basically, the Marshmallow Challenge says, says that um, you have teams of four, and you give them a little bit of material, and you try to get them to build a tower using spaghetti, tape, and a string, and put, uh, put a marshmallow as high as possible, with the tower as high as possible. And uh, the interesting thing about this challenge is that architects do really well in it, of course. MBAs, not so much, right? But there's a mystery group that does really well, and those are kindergartners. <laughs> so these kids, of, these kids from kindergarten are doing really well because... They're constantly, they're, instead of actually building the tower and at the very end trying to put the marshmallow on top, they're constantly building the tower without planning, without too much of that thinking, and putting that marshmallow on top. And then trying again if it falls apart, and then trying again. And that's, what I, that's the message I want to leave with you today, because I think that is really what data-driven education is. That is rapid iteration, right? And so what, I, what I'd like to leave you with today is build that, build that tower early, put that marshmallow on top, and, and keep doing it. Cheers.